Good to see everyone here this evening. If you're joining us, we're glad to have you. We are studying the book of Revelation, and we just began last Wednesday evening, so we will continue tonight by talking about some more background matters. We talked uh, last week about apocalyptic literature and what it's about, what it's trying to communicate, and the first thing that we said is that apocalyptic literature is always written in a time of some crisis or conflict, and I posed the question and asked you to think uh, about what would be the crisis or conflict that was facing the early Christians, and that's what we want to talk about this evening, and that has to do with the date of the book as well, and and more importantly, the date tells us about the context and the conflict and the crisis. So it's not just uh, an academic discussion about when a book was written or something like that. It has everything to do with what the book is about in the case of the book of Revelation. So uh, as we notice these things, just kind of uh, to get our bearings here, the date of Revelation is related to the question of what the book is about. The question of the date will also help us to answer or tell us who the enemy is. Who is it that God is about to destroy? Remember, we said that apocalyptic literature is about an impending judgment. God is going to set things right and uh, judge the enemy and vindicate the faithful. So who is the enemy that uh, is going to be judged here? The date of the book will help us to tell that. And, of course, that will bring us to the main question of what was the problem or the crisis. Now, this is not uh, that difficult of a question to answer just simply from a historical point of view because of what we know about early Christianity, there were really only two groups that ever caused the early Christians problems. One group was the Jews. And so there is the possibility that we have to deal with that the problem or the crisis that these Christians were facing was conflict with the Jews, the Jews causing them difficulty in some way. If that turns out to be what is going on, then that would tell us that the symbolism of the book is about Judaism, that the enemy and all of these ugly images that we see are depictions of a religion gone wrong, and that the destruction that is coming would have to therefore be the destruction of Jerusalem, if we take that point of view. Now, there's only one other group of uh, people that ever caused the early Christians trouble in the first century, and that was unbelieving Gentiles. If it is not the Jews that are causing the problem, if it is a Gentile crisis, then the book is referring to something else. It is referring to elements of Roman Hellenistic paganism. And the destruction that is being talked about is not going to be a destruction of Jerusalem. It's going to be a destruction of something else. And so those are really the two possibilities. And we really don't need to go through history looking for any other possibilities because those are the only two uh, that are historically attested. So it's going to be one of those two. We also have to ask, uh, as we do this, uh, another question, what was the nature of the conflict? Uh, Specifically, was it persecution? Now, there have been all kinds of uh, answers given to this, and we don't need to explore them all. It seems to me, as you read the book of Revelation, that opposition of a physical kind is certainly in the works here. There is some kind of persecution going on. Even in the letters, we hear about Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, and the Lord telling one of the churches that I uh, am going to give you tribulation for 10 days. We hear later on in the story about people going through a great tribulation, about a beast making war with the lamb and with the saints. And it doesn't seem to be just something like false doctrine or a general depiction of the conflict of good versus evil. Uh, There seems to be something of a a physical nature. We hear the souls underneath the altar crying out, How long, O Lord, will you not avenge our blood? People are dying or are going to die in this. And so it seems to me uh, that persecution is the answer to the question But once we ask that question, 
there is another problem that develops because there were two kinds of persecution that Christians faced. And this is something that is not always acknowledged, but I think that it is absolutely critical to understanding the situation here. There was, uh, on occasion, official government-sponsored persecution. And we do know throughout history that on occasion, Christianity was outlawed and edicts were issued uh, against Christians. And so one of the possibilities we have to ask is, is that the persecution that's going on reflected in the book of Revelation? There has been a lot of ink spilt on this. There have been a lot of books written taken, taking that position. But there is another kind of persecution that the early Christians face. As a matter of fact, if you read the book of Acts, you see this second kind of persecution more than you see anything else. And that is non-official persecution, where the people who live in town just don't want Christians there, where they drag Paul and Silas before the authorities and have them beaten, or where there's a riot and people are told that they have to leave town and can't come back, or when Paul uh, gets the city of Ephesus in an uproar, and it's not the government that uh, is upset, it's the artisans, it's the shopkeepers and people like that that raise the riot and cause the trouble. That's the kind of persecution you read about in the book of Acts. And so there is another kind of persecution, and it could be just as deadly, it could be just as dangerous. You know that Paul was risking his life in Ephesus, Whatever it was that Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that we despaired of our lives in Asia and we were counting on God who raises from the dead to deliver us. Uh, Paul thought he was going to die uh, at something that happened in Asia Minor. And so there are two kinds of persecution, and so we have to ask if we're going to go the route of persecution, which one of these was it? And... If we're going to go the route of Gentile persecution, that raises another question. Why would Gentiles persecute Christians? We know why Jews would. Because they were jealous at the preaching of the gospel. They didn't like what the apostolic message said. But it's a little bit harder to answer the question, why would Gentiles persecute Christians? So I'm not proposing any answers at this point. I'm just simply raising the questions that we have to address before we study the book of Revelation, and I want to take the rest of our time this evening to try to answer this set of questions that we have now proposed. There are two possibilities, basically, uh, to all of this. One involves an early date, and the other involves a late date. If we believe that the book of Revelation was written at the so-called early date, sometime in the mid-60s A.D., then it could be Jewish persecution or it could be Roman persecution. We do know that Christians were persecuted under Nero in the year 64 AD because a very famous event happened in that year. Anybody remember what it was? Rome burned and Nero blamed it on the Christians and killed many of them uh, in the process. That's a possibility. And so what we've got to do is we've got to go through looking through ancient history, looking for some times that will fit. That's one of them. But of course, we also know from the book of Acts that Jews were persecuting Christians in various cities. And so if we take the early date, those two possibilities exist. There is another possibility that involves a late date of the book, and that would be in the 90s AD under the Roman emperor Domitian, and that would involve a Roman persecution. There is no evidence of a Jewish persecution after 70 AD, because what happens after 70, what happens in 70 AD? Destruction of Jerusalem. Judaism pretty much falls apart for the next 65 years or 70 years or so until they can get their act together again. There is no Jewish persecution of Christians that we know of going on after 70. So any persecution after 70 is going to be a Roman one. And if you are not familiar with the emperors that are involved, these are the emperors in this time period, Nero, Galba, Otho, and Vitellus. The year that Nero dies uh, sparks a uh, power struggle in Rome, and there is the famous 
what is called the year of the three emperors, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius, each came to the throne that year. None of them died by any natural means. Finally, uh, Vespasian claims the throne. He cuts off the siege of Jerusalem to go back to Rome and claim the throne. And uh, he reigns for 10 years. Then his son Titus becomes emperor. And then Vespasian's other son, Domitian, becomes emperor. And that takes us down almost to the end of the first century, uh, to the end of New Testament times. So is it under Nero or is it under Domitian uh, at the end of the period? Well, let's start looking at what we might find for answers. Let me suggest to you, first of all, that it's not the Jews. There is no evidence of widespread Jewish persecution of Christians in Asia Minor or anywhere, for that matter, in the first century A.D. There is sporadic Jewish persecution in various places at various times, but there is no organized persecution, certainly, of Jews. There is no movement on the part of the Jews to, let's get the Christians. And you might say, well, why do we have to have that? Why can't it be a sporadic kind of thing? Because the book of Revelation doesn't seem to be talking about a sporadic once-in-a-while thing. John is writing to a group of churches in Asia Minor telling them that you're all going to get hit with this, that every one of you needs to be prepared for this. And uh, there is just no evidence that the Jews in Asia Minor had any kind of uprising against the Christians. So that's one thing to consider. And kind of another consideration that is about something that kind of doesn't exist, but it's an important point. If we're going to say that could it be Jewish persecution, then we would have to answer the difficult question of why John is writing about the destruction of Jerusalem to Christians who live a couple thousand miles from there in Asia Minor. It seems to me that if we're going to go with a destruction of Jerusalem picture of the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation might have been written to Judean Christians or Palestinian Christians who would have been closer to the problem. But why John would have written about the destruction of Jerusalem to people who lived hundreds of miles from there, uh, it, it seems is a problem. Now, there may be some that say, well, I, I think it's a Jewish problem, but bear with me. There's another thing to consider here. Revelation chapter 17. There's a pretty big hint in the book of Revelation as to who the enemy is. Revelation 17.1, come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. First of all, just taking that picture at face value, Jerusalem doesn't sit on the water. Jerusalem's in the mountains of Judea. But there is a city that sits very, very close to the water in the ancient world, that is Rome, just a couple miles up the Tiber River from Ostia. The kings of the earth committed acts of immorality with her. Some people say, well, that's the idolatry, but it's also a description of Rome. But even more than that, um, Revelation chapter 17, we have a description here uh, in verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. If I say to you the Windy City, you know I'm talking about Chicago. The Big Apple is New York, and the city of seven hills is Rome. There was no other city in the ancient world that was called the city of seven hills. Now, there have been some attempts to make Jerusalem that, but there are only three hills in Jerusalem, not seven. And you have to really go to some great lengths to get this to be Jerusalem. Everybody would have known seven hills. There's only one place in the ancient world that had seven hills, a city built on seven hills, and that was Rome. Look also in verse 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Jerusalem didn't reign over the kings of the earth in the first century. Rome was ruling over the kings of the earth. Jerusalem was a client kingdom of the Romans. And then in verse 1, 
Uh, we are told here, of course, remember, as we said, uh, the great harlot who sits on many waters. And again, in 1811, uh, the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Verse 11, they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, say, Woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth. That doesn't describe Jerusalem. Jerusalem didn't have a port. To get goods to Jerusalem, you had to unload them at Caesarea, put them on wagons, and carry them up the mountains to Jerusalem. But Rome did have a port. It was connected to the sea by the Tiber River. And so if we take these descriptions at face value, just kind of as a beginning point, uh, the picture that develops is a very clear picture of Rome. And so I want to suggest to you tonight that we can cross Jewish persecution off the list for at least three reasons. That leaves us with two Roman persecutions, an early one and a later one. Let me suggest to you that the persecution that John is talking about is not the persecution that happened under Nero. Now, that again is uh, favored by some people, say, well, we've got a persecution that we know of, Nero, 64 AD, what more could you ask for? Well, the fact is that there is absolutely no evidence that that persecution went beyond the city of Rome. Nero kills Christians in Rome, but there is no evidence, and we have a lot of evidence from the first century about life in Asia Minor. Nobody in Asia Minor was talking about any persecution going on. There is absolutely nothing said about it. And so I want to suggest to you that we can cross Roman persecution under Nero off the list. And that leaves one more time that this could be, and that is the late date Roman persecution under Domitian. Now, it's not just that we wind up with that by default. I want to show you this evening that there is evidence that that is exactly the right answer. A fellow named Irenaeus was a Christian who lived in the early 2nd century, right after the time of the apostles. And he wrote a lot of books, and he wrote books about all kinds of things, and he mentions the apostles in his books, and this is what he says in one of his books. He says, as to the name of the Antichrist, for if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision. He's referring there to the book of Revelation. That's really the only thing he can be talking about. For that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day towards the end of Domitian's reign. Now, some of these early Christians were wrong about some things. You hear Irenaeus thinking that the Antichrist is a particular person, and he's probably wrong about that. And, you know, some of the early Christians believe things that you and I would not agree with. It doesn't mean that just because they say something that they are automatically correct. But here's a guy that lives in the early 2nd century who would have been in a better position to know some of these things than we are, and he says that this apocalyptic vision, referring here to the writings of John, was seen almost in my day towards the end of Domitian's reign. Domitian leaves the throne in 96, and Irenaeus is writing before the year 110. So within 14 years, probably within about 10 years, uh, he is talking about this. Later on, in the 300s, there is a guy named Eusebius. And he writes the first official, well, official church history, the first person to write a history of the church. And he's got a lot of information in that church history that did not survive from ancient times. And this is what he says about John. It is said that in this persecution, speaking of the time of uh, Domitian, the apostle and evangelist John, who was still alive, was condemned to dwell on the island of Patmos in consequence of his testimony to the divine word. John says in Revelation 1 that he's on the island of Patmos. Irenaeus, in the fifth book of his work against heresies, where he discusses the, name, the number of the name Antichrist, which is given in the so-called Apocalypse of John, speaks and he quotes the passage that I just showed you. He goes on to say this, To such a degree, indeed, 
did the teaching of our faith flourish at that time that even those writers who were far from our religion did not hesitate to mention in their histories the persecution and the martyrdoms which took place during it. And they indeed accurately indicated the time, for they recorded that in the 15th year of Domitian, Flavia Domitilla, daughter of a sister of Flavius Clement, who at that time was one of the consuls of Rome, was exiled with many others to the island of Pontia in consequence of testimony born to Christ. Now, let me tell you that what Eusebius is talking about there is somewhat debated. And there is some evidence that some of these later Christians exaggerated the claims of persecution under Domitian. And I tend to believe that. The fact is there's just not a lot of evidence for official government persecution under Domitian. This is all just about that Eusebius can say about it, that he knows of one person who got kicked out of Rome because they were a Christian and they were high up in the government. That's not exactly edicts against Christianity or official government, widespread government persecution. But it's, it, but it's something to consider, okay? So that doesn't nail the case down. But here we have something going on. I mean, there has to be something there for these people to exaggerate if they are exaggerating. And uh, Eusebius does seem to know of some people who actually got in trouble for being Christians. But there's more to it. Revelation 13. <clears throat> One of the more interesting visions in the book, Revelation 13 too, John sees a dragon, a great beast, coming uh, out of the sea. The beast which I saw was like a leopard... Uh, Actually, verse 3 is where I wanted to go. I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed. In verse 12, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. And then in 14, uh, the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and had come to life. Now, you may not know it, but there was a rumor going around at the end of the first century that Nero hadn't died. Anybody know how Nero did die? He committed suicide. He stabbed himself in the neck. There was a rumor going around at the end of the first century that Nero hadn't died, that he had simply gone into hiding, and that he was back, and now he was calling himself Domitian. And that was called the Nero Redivivus myth. And we know about this myth from several sources in the ancient world. It's not like just some obscure person says something about it. People were talking about this in the first century. And if that sounds really weird, uh, I bid you to think back just a few years ago when David Koresh and all of his people died in Waco, Texas. If you were paying attention, uh, about a week after that, all the tabloid magazines, the National Enquirer and all that stuff said, David Koresh is still alive. What happened when Elvis died? People have been seeing Elvis for years, right? This idea that a famous person might not be dead is really nothing new. The ancients believed it about Nero. And the reason they believed it about Nero is because there had not been a man this cruel and this demented since the time of Nero. Domitian was just like him in many ways. And so there was this story going around that, hey, this is just simply Nero coming around. And uh, this myth circulated widely and was applied to Domitian. Now, you get in Revelation 13 this beast that has a fatal wound, and yet he's still alive. That sounds an awful lot like this story that was circulating at the end of the first century. Again, that might not be conclusive proof, but it's another thing to consider. But there is something else, though, I think, that is much closer to home. 
There was a Roman governor who was the governor of the province of Bithynia. If you don't know where that's at on a map, if you look at the churches of Asia Minor and go straight north, run into the Black Sea, you're at Bithynia. In the early 2nd century A.D., about the time that Irenaeus, the other guy we quoted, was alive. And the Roman Roman emperor at that time was a man named Trajan, and Pliny wrote a bunch of letters to the emperor asking him for advice on legal cases. How do I decide this? What do I do with this? And letter number 96 is the letter that he writes to Trajan asking him, what do I do with Christians? And it's an interesting letter. Let's read a little bit of it. He says this, Among some other things, having never been present at any trials of the Christians. Now, what does that tell you, first of all? They've been going on before. This is not the first one. I am unacquainted with the method and limits to be observed, either in examining or punishing them. In the meanwhile, the method I have observed toward those who have been denounced to me as Christians is this. So here's what I've been doing, Trajan. I interrogated them whether they were Christians. If they confessed it, I repeated the question twice again, adding the threat of capital punishment. If they still persevered, I ordered them to be executed. For whatever the nature of their creed might be, I could at least feel no doubt that contumacy and inflexible obstinacy deserve chastisement. I had them killed just because they're stubborn. You know, I don't know what they believe, but, you know, they're troublemakers, obviously. He says, a placard was put up without any signature, accusing a large number of persons by name. Now, before you read any more of that, you just think about that. You wake up tomorrow morning, and outside the city limits of Temple Terrace is a billboard with all the names of the people who are accused of being Christians, and your name is on it. So all these people get rounded, and nobody has signed this thing. It's just up there. Those who denied that they were or had ever been Christians, who repeated after me an invocation to the gods and offered adoration with wine and frankincense to your image, which I had ordered to be brought for that purpose, together with those of the gods, and who finally cursed Christ, none of which acts it is said those who are really Christians can be forced into performing, these I thought it proper to discharge. So if they worship the gods, worship the emperor, curse Christ, I figure they're not Christians and I let them go. Others who were named by that informer at first confessed themselves Christians and then denied it. True, they had been of that persuasion, but they had quitted it. Some three years, others many years, and as few as much as 25 years ago. This is about the year 117, which would make this what year? 25 years ago. 92, right in the middle of Domitian's reign. They all worshipped your statue and the images of the gods and cursed Christ. Here's some pretty solid historical evidence that trials of Christians are going on at the end of the first century and into the early second century. Pliny doesn't know exactly, he's never been at one of these before, but I want you to notice the procedure he uses. He says, here's how I find out. I see if they'll worship the gods and if they will worship your image, the image of the emperor. If they do that and curse Christ, I let them go. Now, it's interesting that that should be the test that is performed. The fact that Pliny doesn't know what to do means that there is no official persecution going on. Kind of like what we read in the book of Acts. People are dragging Christians into court on complaints, but if there had been a law outlawing Christianity, Pliny certainly would have known about that. These are things that he doesn't know too much about. Well, Trajan writes Pliny a letter back, and I don't put it up on the screen because we don't have time, but Trajan writes back and says, if people get accused of being a Christian to you, deal with it, but don't go looking for these people. 
Now that's interesting. Trajan says don't seek them out. In other words, we don't have an official policy that it's against the law to be a Christian. If they cause trouble, deal with them, but there's no law against it. And Pliny's remark about the time certainly puts this right in the time of Domitian. So we've got a growing body of evidence that points to the late date. And this is the important thing. The persecution that's going on in the time of Domitian is not official governmental persecution. There may have been a person or two that Domitian kicked out of the empire because they were Christians, but there are no laws on the books in Rome condemning Christianity at this point. The persecution is of a social nature, where the people of the town don't like Christians and they cause them trouble. And you might think, well, how could that be such of a problem? Well, do you remember Hebrews 10? If you don't think that social persecution could be difficult, uh, remember what the author says in Hebrews 10, uh, starting in... uh, Let's start in verse 32. 32 would be the best place. (laughs) Remember the former days when after being lightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. These people had been thrown in jail and all their possessions taken from them, not because it was against the law to be Christians, but because this is how townspeople treated them. And everything that we have suggests that that is exactly what's going on in Asia Minor at the end of the first century, that people just don't like Christians being around, and the persecution's not coming from the government, it's coming from the locals. Now that brings us to how that would happen in the Roman emperor cult. There was an organization, you may have heard of it, you may not have, called the Commune of Asia. It was not a part of the Roman government. That's important to understand. It was an organization that the province of Asia Minor had created for itself. They did not have the authority to make laws. Only Rome could do that. They did not have the authority to collect taxes. Only Rome can do that. So this is purely a local organization. But they used this organization to endear themselves to Rome, to show their loyalty to the Romans. It was originally a provincial assembly, and if you lived in one of these towns, you had a delegate that would go to these meetings every year. Over 100 people showed up. The annual president of this organization was the chief priest of the emperor cult and was probably called an Asiarch. Paul knew some people called Asiarchs in Acts 19.31. They held annual meetings at various cities, and if you ever get to go to Turkey and visit some of these places, you will see inscriptions where the cities brag about this that we got to be the favorite city, we got to have the meeting this year. So-and-so did it last year, but we did it this year. And they bragged about that. Now, worshiping the emperor is a strange thing to us. And at first, the emperors didn't like this idea. And it's not like, you know, when people started recognizing the emperors as divine, that the emperors just swallowed it up, because... At first, the only way to become divine was to die. You could only be recognized as divine after your death, and no Roman emperor was in a hurry to get recognized as divine if that's what it took. Uh, There are motions in the Roman Senate to declare Augustus a god while he's still alive, and Augustus says, no, 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 that's that's bad luck. You know, you're going to put me in my grave. And so he doesn't like the idea. But there were some emperors who did, Caligula, Nero, and Domitian. These guys insisted on being worshipped as a god. As a matter of fact, Domitian insisted on being addressed as Lord God Domitian. And he passed a law that said, if you're going to make a statue of me, it may not have less than so many pounds of gold or silver in it. Nothing dinky. I want the big ones. Right? He took this stuff very seriously as did Nero. 
Nero has a statue of himself, probably about 32 feet tall, erected outside his house, and he is in the form of the god Apollo in this statue. That statue was called the Colossus of Nero. They tore it down and built another building in its place called the Colosseum. That's why it's called the Colosseum. But if you go to the Colosseum today, right outside, there's this big circular area with a big flat stone in it. That's where the statue stood. A 32-foot statue of Nero as a god. The emperor cult was at its height at the end of the first century. Now, after the second century, we know historically that this thing falls off very sharply. But right at the time that we're guessing here might be a time for the book of Revelation, this thing is in full swing. And the divine status of emperors is depicted in images and in architecture and in the text that people were writing. I want you to look at just a couple things here. This is a map of Asia Minor. And the churches of Revelation are along the coast here. Seven churches right along in here. So keep that spot on the map in your mind. Every spot on that map there is where there was an altar to the emperor. Every city in that spot there. And you can see that there are a bunch right through there. Every spot on that map is where they had a temple to the emperor. See even more of them there on that map. Every spot on that map was a city that had a priest to the emperor. And if you put all three maps together, that's what they look like. The churches of the book of Revelation were located geographically, organizationally, and culturally where the emperor cult was the most heavily distributed. <coughs> right in the thick of it. Right in here. You remember Matthew 22? Somebody came up to Jesus testing him and said, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And uh, that was a trick question because of what was on the coins. This is the coin you had to use to pay the tax. And it, the inscription around here says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine, see D-I-V-I, -I, son of the divine Augustus. That coin calls Augustus a god. And the Jews said, I don't know if I can do this. Because when I pay taxes, Am I acknowledging Augustus as a god? And if that's the case, I can't do that. And so they brought that to Jesus and said, What do you think? And Jesus, of course, said, Give to God what belongs to God. Call God, God, and give Caesar his money. But it's interesting that in the time of Jesus, that was a problem for people, for Jews that they realized that this worship of the emperor was a problem. This is a, uh, a piece of Roman artwork. I think it's in a museum in France someplace. It was uh, done in about the middle of the first century. And uh, it is called uh, the Gemma Augustea. Roman artwork is really interesting. You'll notice that there are two scenes here. And it's not because they couldn't fit it all on one line. In Roman artwork, this down here is where people live, and this up here is where gods live. See the guy sitting on the throne, being crowned, speaking with the god Mars? That's Augustus right there. He's a god. That's the middle of the first century. Some of you have been to Rome. This is the Arch of Titus. If you're in the Colosseum, you just look out the window and it's right there. Big, big arch. If you go where these people are, right here, right in the middle of the arch, and look straight up, you see this. There is an eagle, and this is the Emperor Titus. And this eagle is carrying him up to heaven to join the gods. This is saying Titus is now a god. This is a sculpture called the Parthian Monument, 2nd century, so a little bit later. It's been defaced 
from ancient times, but this is a Roman emperor here, and he is in a chariot being pulled by a horse here, and the, the goddess Victory, and this is the chariot of the sun, by the way, the chariot that pulls the sun across the sky every day, it's taking him up to heaven to where the gods are. He's being deified. This is everywhere. It's in the architecture. It's in the artwork. It's in the literature. And so I want to suggest to you that this is what's going on as the background of the book of Revelation. The imperial cult was a form of paganism. And the Christian's objection to it was exactly the same as the Jews in Matthew 22. That we cannot honor the emperor as a god. I'm sorry, we can't do that. And that second point is very important. Christians were hated and ill-treated not because, it should say, they were Christians, but because they wouldn't worship the emperor or the other gods. We think, well, what's the big deal? Who cares whether you worship the gods or not? Some of you know already, but the reason you worship the gods in the ancient world was for what reason? So they won't get angry at you. They don't love you. They don't like you. But they can get angry at you. And the reason you worship the gods is to keep them from getting angry. If you get one angry at you, he might flood your city. He might cause your town to start on fire. And if you don't worship the gods, people look at you and say, what's wrong with you? You wanting something bad to happen to us? And so imagine what it's like when a Christian moves into your town and will not worship the gods and will not worship the emperor. What are you trying to do? Get us in trouble? You want the emperor to think that we don't care about him? That, that we're a bunch of rebels? You think you want us to, to get in trouble with the gods? It wasn't just a quarrel over idols. It was about who is God around here. And the Christians said, we already have our Lord and Savior. And it's not Augustus, and it's not Domitian, and it's not anybody else. It's Jesus. And so what we have is kind of a storm on the horizon in the book of Revelation. The persecution is just starting. Antipas, the faithful witness, has been killed. As far as others, hard to say. There are some souls under the altar who have been beheaded. But John says more is coming. And I want to suggest to you that this is what they were facing. This opposition because of their refusal to worship the, uh, the emperor. Uh, we've got a minute or two left here. Anybody have a question or comment about anything we've looked at this evening? Well, we're going to proceed on the assumption that John is writing at the end of the first century that the problem is the emperor cult. That's the, the basis that we're going to proceed on. So thank you for your good attention this evening.